A murderer has been on the loose in my hometown. I never thought I'd be in bed with him spooning me. The first victim was just an innocent young couple found dead in their car together. But this was no normal killing. Whoever murdered them went over the top, mangled apart with their tongues ripped out and their eyes completely gone. The rumor in the town was that it was some sort of wild beast killing people, but the truth was so, so much worse. My mom laughed when I told her about the rumor of the Gosbeck's null beast. Apparently the beast was around in her high school days too. Two people turned up dead before it stopped, conveniently at the same time a bear was brought down in the area. She tried comforting me, saying it was likely just a bear. No human would do anything that disgusting to another human, right? Maybe it'll spare your eyes if it gets you, she said. As if that was supposed to make me feel any better. I never would have guessed how much worse the truth was. My mother always makes jokes about my eyes. Since I have heterochromia, a condition which means my eyes are two different colors. Maybe the beast would be into you because of your eyes, my mother chuckled. Funny enough, heterochromia is what may have saved my life and maybe the lives of a few others. She told me just not to go smooching any girls around there and I'd be fine. Of course this is when I corrected her and said I preferred boys, but this really didn't take her by surprise. Mom's good like that. However, this time the beast wasn't content just to gnaw on the faces of teens on our lover's lane. When I got into school about a week after the first incident, I knew something was wrong. Everyone was quiet and a lot of people were crying. I found my friend Trent and asked him what was up. He criticized me for not checking my Facebook before he told me. Douglas Stafford found dead in his parents' garage, his face gnawed on just like the pair from earlier. The next day there was a school assembly where the principal even teared up a bit and told us that it was okay if we were upset and if necessary we could take an absence from class to talk to the school counselor. Doug's girlfriend, Kathy was in the front row bawling. They dated since their little freshman years and it was pretty obvious they would have one day gotten a house with a white picket fence and a dog. Kathy was the last casualty of the school year. A few months later she was found dead in the forest. The beast hadn't been the one to kill her though. She had taken herself with a rope and apparently Beastie helped himself, at least according to the rumors. But this is when the murders really picked up the pace. The first victim of junior year was Camille Dunn. She'd missed her bus home and decided to walk. The next morning a dog walker found her stretched out on the sidewalk, eyes gone and face eaten off. The beast was back. Clearly there was some madman or wild animal on the loose and everyone put up their guard. But now I think this is when the beast got really cocky. He realized he could get away with this shit. The next victims were in their damn house. An elderly couple, John and Beatrice. They lived across the street from me. When I woke up the next morning to sirens, my heart sank. It was the same thing. Ate the faces in the eyes. It got into the house through the back window, judging by the bloody prints. Kids whispered about how supposedly the prints looked like humans, but Claude's sightings of the beast grew in number. A freak that had fangs and glowing eyes, his only desire being to hunt and kill. Of course. My mom immediately kicked in a curfew and kept the house secure. At night, I'd hear her wake up and walk around as if to make sure we were safe. I believed in the beast when she saw it too. I woke up to hear her scream and I ran to the source. My mom was white as a ghost, her hand on her heart as she stared out the now empty window. It it was there. I don't know what it was, but call the police. Call the police right now. Cops showed up surprisingly fast, and mom told them what happened while her eyes still darted to the window. On occasion, she'd gone down because she couldn't sleep, and it was at the window. Its shape was vaguely humanoid, but its eyes did in fact glow. That's when she screamed. It must have not expected her to see it as it took off running. And sure enough, when I went into the backyard the next morning, its feet were indeed clawed. I didn't bother collecting evidence as I'm sure everyone would have thought. I faked it, but I knew the beast was real. Two days later I got kidnapped by my so-called friend. I was walking home from school when Trent ran up behind me, acting all buddy-buddy until he got close. Then I felt a switchblade press against my side. Trent was still smiling, but it was cold, dark. Start walking, you queer. I didn't try to be the hero and get the knife. Trent was bigger than me and I didn't have a prayer. We walked until we got to his car where he pushed me into the back seat and he duct taped my hands and feet together. He drove us out of town to this abandoned old shed. Two other guys I didn't know were waiting there and I saw more knives. I was close to peeing myself while still being neck deep in denial. Surely this had to be a joke though, just a prank to scare me. Trent dragged me inside and slammed the door. It was dark and I couldn't see anything. I got whacked in the stomach and the air whooshed out of my lungs. You freak. How many times did you touch me when I slept over, huh? I could hear the sneer in Trent's voice. I groaned as I was shoved to my knees. Never, Trent, you're not exactly my type, I said as I struggled against the tape. I got kicked across the face and I hit the floor. I felt one of my teeth come loose and blood started to pool in my gums. Trent squatted down next to me. I could barely make out his silhouette and the cracks in the shed. Damn liar. You're a freak. And now you're going to be another victim of the Gospex No Beast, old buddy. I felt the blade press right beneath my blue eye. 
Hope your mommy doesn't miss your creepy back eyes. I wanted to shut my eyes, hope that he'd drive the knife right into my brain so I didn't have to feel it. Instead, I felt my eyes stay wide open as the blade glinted and I suddenly made out Trent and his three goonies. Yeah, three goonies. There were only two outside the shed. Guess the beast really doesn't care for copycats. I heard the scream before the tallest of the figures slammed the other two heads together. When standing straight up, he almost reached the ceiling. Trent whipped around and the blade nicked below my eye. What the hell? Another whack, and Trent was on the ground. I heard him choking and realized I smelled blood. The figure moved onto me and he hoisted me up to his level. I felt claws tear my shirt. I was certain I'd be dead. Then I felt the monster pause. Eyes. I passed out. When I came to, it was now dark outside and we were no longer in the shed. Now we were in a cabin lit by a lantern, and I saw the beast in his entirety. He looked vaguely human, wearing what looked like a loincloth, had pale skin and black stringy hair that hung down his back. His skin was occasionally broken up by patches of scales, and his fingers looked like a tiny blade stuck out of each. His spine was lined with thin bristles that would rise and fall with each breath. Trent was hung up in the corner by a hook, awake and filled with terror. I could smell more blood. The beast examined Trent's face thoughtfully before his middle finger carved through his cheek. I shut my eyes tight when I heard Trent scream. The beast made almost no sound at all, other than a soft hum as he worked on carving off Trent's face. When I took a peek, I saw the gleaming white of Trent's cheekbones. My eyes shut again. Finally, when the screams went quiet, I heard footsteps. Approach felt his huge presence kneel over me. His hair smelled like pond weeds. Open open your eyes. I did, although I'm not sure why. His face was somewhat human, had a strong nose and gaunt features, but it was his eyes that caught me. They glowed all right, but the left one was yellow and the right I was violet. The beast inhaled sharply before his hand reached up to my face. I flinched and tilted my head away, but he only hushed me as he lightly caressed my cheek. His claws didn't even break skin. Eyes. They don't match. I swallowed. Neither do yours, I pointed out. The beast grinned. His crooked teeth flecked with blood. No, no, they don't, he said, almost as if he was trying not to laugh. I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I reached up to touch his face too. His skin was oily. It almost reminded me of a fish. They look good, though. I offered. Play nice with the monster. Maybe you can go home. This comment struck him. He looked shocked. Then he pulled me into the most uncomfortable hug of my life. Only one thought I was the only one. He sobbed, I felt his greasy tears hit the top of my head. Really not sure of how to handle this. I patted his back, careful to avoid the spines. God knew they were probably poisonous. Thankfully the beast seemed to appreciate this. There he was, him, his big spoon and me, his little spoon hugging me with his warmth. I'm really not sure how I fell asleep with a giant stinky monster spooning me, but I did. To be honest, I liked it. I don't know how, but for some reason I felt safe with him. But when I woke up the next morning, the police were there. According to them, someone called 911 for my phone and told them where to find me. I attended Trent's funeral. I don't know why, but I did. His sister apologized for all the bullshit he did to me. I saved her the knowledge of the fact he was going to murder me and make it look like the beast did it. When I got home late that night, I found muscle shells on my window sill. I took them inside and let them rest on my dresser. The top of my dresser is covered with little gifts now, from snakeskins to smooth rocks to glass beads. I haven't seen him since that night, but sometimes I catch a glimpse of those mismatched eyes glowing from my backyard.